to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, I debated on what to call this message, and then, it, <laughs> and then it hit me. I said, well, I did nuggets for dad. I did nuggets for mom. I did nuggets for couples. I think I'm going to call this nuggets for teens. Nuggets for teens. But it's for youth. It's for youth. Uh, you may be older than a teen. You may be in 25, 30, 35 years old, and this, some of this stuff could still help you if you'll listen. You may be a grandma or grandpa, and if you'll listen to some of this stuff, it could still help you. you it'll still help you. Now, in 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, is speaking. And he is speaking to a young man. When I say a young man, I'm saying he was probably a teenager or very early 20s. He was very young. Look what he says in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. He tells him to be an example of to the believers. Now, we know that it's real easy and everybody understands that adults are to be good examples, but here Paul is telling this young man that he should be an example. This young lady that she should be an example. Someone young can still be an example. And I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this, kids. You remember when you were younger... Uh, maybe elementary school, there was always someone you looked up to older than you and you, you wanted to be like that person in school. Maybe it was someone you rode the bus with. Maybe it was an older brother, older sister. Maybe it was a cousin. Maybe it was a neighbor. Maybe it was someone in church, but you looked up to someone in your Sunday school class or in another class. You looked up to someone and you thought, man, I want to do that. I want to be like that. I, I wish I was like that. That's being an example. And believe it or not, kids, there's somebody doing that to you right now. Right now, there's somebody at your school. There's somebody in your neighborhood. There's somebody close by wanting to be like you. What kind of influence are you giving? What kind of example are you being? What kind of person are they going to turn out to be? Now, Paul is talking to this young man, and he tells him to be an example. I'm going to read that again in verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth. Oh, they're just a youth. Oh, they're just young. They're young. They're dumb. They don't know what they're doing. Don't let them despise your youth. Show them what you're capable of. Show them how well behaved you are. Show them how smart you are. Show them. Be that example. Amen. Now, he goes on and he says, Be thou an example of the believers in word. Watch your mouth. In conversation, that's your lifestyle. Watch your attitude. In charity. Did you know that it is, it is just as much a command for a young person to give as it is for an older person? Young people, that shocks people more so than any type. You expect an older person to be giving and, 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 thank, and thank people and give. But you know what shocks people more? When a young person gives of his time, when a young person gives of what he's got to help others. That makes a difference, amen? And it goes on and it speaks there in spirit, in faith, in purity, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Of all things to tell a young person, well, preacher, I think you're just too doctrinal. We need something a little bit more for the kids. No, according to Paul, they need to pay attention to doctrine. They need to understand their Bible too, amen? That's tomorrow's leaders, kids, believe it or not. Tomorrow, you're going to be calling the shots. I don't mean literally tomorrow, but you know what I'm saying. You're going to be the boss. You're going to be the leaders. You're going to be the preachers, pastors, missionaries, missionary wives, preachers' wives. You're going to be the Sunday school teachers, the deacons. You're going to be the ones that's calling the shots one day. And every choice you make right now is going to follow you 
and affect you. It will determine whether or not people will follow you, will listen to you. There's people that will never, listen to me, I'm being as honest as I can trying to help you. There will be people that will never come to this church because I'm the pastor. They'll hear who the pastor is and they say, I'm not going down there. Why? Because I was mean in school. I was, I was nasty in school. I was foul in school. I was old enough to know better. But I was still mean. I liked fighting. I liked picking fights. I was a little squirm, squirmy worm. I was a runt of the litter. I was so stupid. But I liked to fight. In fact... Now, there's some come to hear me just because they couldn't believe what they heard. That's happened to me, too. Amen. I, right after I announced my call to preach, I got an opportunity, open door to preach up 115, way up toward Wilkesburg in a little old church in the middle of nowhere. Uh, uh, opportunity to preach, so I was excited. Called my sister up, said, hey, listen, I'm going to be preaching. Won't you come? And tried to get my, my sister in church and everything. And she called one of her friends and told them, she said, He's a what? He's going to do what? See, they rode the bus with me. They knew me when I was in school. They knew me before I got saved. That's all they could remember. And they never believed that that could be a preacher. They came and they filled up. I think it was two pews that they filled up in that church. They come just to see if it's true, if that boy is a preacher or not. And at the end of it, they was all on the altar. Amen. God, in spite of my stupidity, in spite of my foolishness, has used me. But that will still follow me all the days of my life. I'm going to give you some things that I hope will help you. Someone may think, well, I'll never, I'll never be a leader. I, I'm not that smart. I'm not that talented. I'm not, I, I'm not as good as so-and-so or, or this or that or the other. I never dreamed I would be a leader. I never dreamed I would be a pastor. I never dreamed I would be preaching or speaking in front of people. Never in my life would I dream this. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what the Lord can do with you. That's why the decisions you make today are more important than you think. Moms and dads try to stress to you. School counselors try to counsel you and encourage you. Pastors try to warn you and beckon and plead with you to make good decisions because they matter. They matter for you and for our society. They matter. Young people, I'll tell you, I know what most of you want because I, I was in the same boat. I can tell you why a lot of our young people show out and act out and why, they're, why they seem to be so rebellious and all that stuff. A lot of times is they just want attention. They want to be heard. They want to be seen. They want you to know they're there. They want acknowledgement. Amen. A lot of times the bad behavior in a young kid is just simply a cry for attention. And you know what a teenager is? A young kid in an adult body. Amen. 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 And that's just the truth of it. That, that's what it is. And a lot of times the misbehavior and the rebel, the, the bad boy image is just seeking attention. Just need attention. You want to be seen. You want to be heard. And you want respect. You want your mom and dad to respect you. You want your mom and dad to listen and hear your opinion on the thing and, have, and let you make the choice. You want their trust and their respect. If you'll listen tonight, I'll tell you how to get it. I'll tell you how to get it. I'll tell you not how to, only to get their respect. I'll teach you how to get favor with God and with man. You can have both without compromising. You can have both. Learn to control yourself. You want mom and dad's respect? You want their trust? Learn to control yourself first. Learn to control your temper, your anger, your mouth. Learn to control your actions. Learn to control your emotions. Learn to control yourself. 
Don't act out. Don't lash out. Don't respond negatively or harshly or ugly when you're told what to do or when you're told you can't do something. Learn to conduct yourself wisely and they will learn to respect you and learn to trust you. Not only them, but everyone around you. Here's some simple things, some simple nuggets for teens, for youth, that may help you develop character and learn to control yourself. One of the hardest things you'll do in this life, one of the hardest things, there's, there's people that's brilliant with mathematics. They have mastered mathematics. There are those that are brilliant in, in uh, different areas of different things, masonry, carpentry, mechanics, electricians, plumbers. They can master those skills. But I'm going to tell you the hardest thing to master is going to be yourself. The hardest thing you will ever master will be your own tongue. I struggle with that and it gets me in more trouble than anything I know of. Your own tongue, your own actions, and your own attitude. And if you can get a control of those things, it will help you greatly. The younger you learn to control yourself, the better off you'll be through life. Amen. So here's some simple nuggets. No rhyme, no reason. They're not in any specific order. I will give you the first three. They're going to be the spiritual aspect of it. And then we're going to get into just some good practical sound advice nuggets that will help you. First and foremost of, uh, of the things that I've listed here is get saved. Get saved. Uh, I don't mean play church. I don't mean pretend. I don't mean turn over a new leaf. I don't mean go down and get baptized. I don't mean lip service. I don't mean get in the choir and sing. I mean get saved. If you're lost, quit playing games. We're talking about the most important thing in your life, your eternal soul. The destiny of where you will spend eternity hinges on whether or not you get saved. You want mom and dad's respect? You want the world's respect? Get saved. Take, I mean, take it serious, your eternal soul. Amen? Quit playing games with it and coming to church and pretending to be saved when you know you're lost. You can fool the preacher. You can fool mom and dad. You can fool everybody, but you're not going to fool God. Amen. Uh, you talk about being saved. Hey, yeah, I'm saved and live like the devil and follow the world and dress like the world and want to do what the world wants to do. Don't want to go to church. Don't want to serve the Lord. Don't want to do anything for God. And you want everybody to think you're saved. Quit playing games. If you're lost, get saved. That's the most important thing you can do. Just get, your, just get yourself to a place off by yourself. You can call me on the phone. You can come to an altar. You can see me after a service anytime. But get saved. If you won't take something that important serious enough to deal with it, why should I trust you with trivial stuff? The most important thing in this universe is your soul. In your universe, you understand what I'm saying, is your soul. And you're going to play games with it? You're going to postpone getting it right when you know the truth? Why would I trust you with anything important to me? Think about that. Next, get right. Maybe you're saved but you're in a backslid condition. Maybe you're saved, but you're not living right. Maybe you're saved, but you're not doing right. Maybe you're saved. Learn to develop a relationship with the Lord. I mean a real relationship. I'm not talking about go to church on Sunday and that's the only time the Bible gets open. I don't mean uh, go to church on Sunday and bow your head when the preacher says bow your head. I'm saying bow your head every day. Get a relationship with him. Get a prayer life. Get a reading schedule. Get a time that you've set aside for him. Amen. And get a relationship. Get to know the Lord personally, regularly. 
Next, this is the easiest one of them all. Do what you know to do now. Do what you know to do and do it now. Do it now. You know you should... You know you should read your Bible. You know you should pray. You know you should get saved. You know you should get right. You know all these things. Then do them. If it's the right thing to do, then do it. Don't put it off. Don't quit, quit pushing it off to the side. Quit waiting for another date. Quit waiting to get older. Do it now. That's how important it is. You know that you ought to be witnessing some of your friends and you don't. Why don't you? You know you ought to be inviting your friends and you don't. Why don't you? Because you're not right. Something's wrong in your heart. If you're ashamed of Jesus, something's wrong in your heart. If you're too ashamed of Jesus to tell your friends about Jesus and invite your friends to Sunday school or to a church service, something's wrong. I think those are the most important things you can do. That's not all you can do. Those are the most important things. But here, I'm going to give you some more things just to think about for a little bit. Uh, the first three things was the spiritual. The last seven is going to be just the good old, just practical nuggets that will help you. First of all, turn to Proverbs. We're going to look at some verses here. It ain't going to hurt y'all. Y'all need to learn to flip in your Bible and find some of these verses. Turn to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. And, pro and keep that thing handy. We're going to use it a little bit tonight. This thing's so sticky. Proverbs chapter 20. Look at verse 1. I mean, look at it. I don't mean just turn there and look at the preacher and grin. I mean see what the Bible says. Amen. I want you to turn me off and look at that book and let it do its job. I prayed all day that the Holy Spirit would just do a work in y'all's hearts tonight. Amen. Look at this. Look at this. Wine is a mocker. Verse 1 there in chapter 20. Strong drink is raging and whosoever, whosoever... Whosoever, that's you, that's your mama, your daddy, your grandpa, your grandma, that's your kids, your cousins, your friends at school, that's the co-workers. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Look at chapter 21. Chapter 21 and verse 7. 21, make that 17. 21, 17. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. How many rich winos do you know? How many wealthy alcoholics do you know? Not many. You know why? Because they spend all they've got on wine and beer and liquor. So the first thing, kids, is don't drink and don't do drugs. Don't do anything that will get a hold of you and won't let go. Anything that you can get addicted to can follow you the rest of your life. And it will be a fight and a struggle for the rest of your life. I know people. Now listen, go up to an alcoholic on the street and ask him, is that what you wanted to be when you grew up? They probably had dreams of being doctors or lawyers or firemen or policemen. They had dreams that they wanted to do this, own their own business, be an electrician, own their own business and do this and do that and the other. And the bottle got a hold of them. And the bottle didn't let go of them. Yeah, but I'm stronger than that. That's exactly what they thought. Not me. It'll never be me. It never is till it is. Oh, I'd never do some of that stuff. Oh, oh, preacher, preacher, I've heard the horror stories, how they lie and cheat and steal from their own mom and dad and their grandparents, how they rob houses and steal from the neighbors and how they're in trouble with the law all the time just so they can get that next tie, that next fix, that next joint, that next snort, that next whatever. Oh, that wouldn't be me, preacher. I'd never do that. That's what they said. 
and that's what they're doing. Alcohol will ruin your testimony. Alcohol will ruin your health. I went to a funeral of a man in his early 20s. He had got out of college, a four-year degree. Young man laying there in the casket with his mom and dad crying. He was married and had, had, a, had small children and a young wife sitting there widowed. He's weeping. Why? Why? Because he drank so much he damaged his liver and it killed him. You say alcohol wouldn't do that. Alcohol did it to someone I knew and worked with. I had an opportunity to lead him to the Lord while he was in college. But the damage had already been done. Years of drinking through high school, taking, taking the funnels and pouring it in there and having the parties and enjoying all the time that he had. He damaged his liver and the last years of his life was miserable. In and out of the hospitals, back and forth to the doctors, trying all these tests, finding out that it was terminal, there's nothing they could do. Seeing his wife and his family deteriorate, crying and weeping, knowing there's nothing he could, they could do for him, while they sought for somebody to help. Called me and said, Preacher, I don't understand. I got saved. Yeah, but you still have to pay for those sins. You got saved and your soul sealed and you're going to heaven when you die. But that flesh still pays for those bad choices. So don't make those bad choices. Don't drink. Don't do drugs. Don't do that to yourself. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Secondly, turn to Ephesians 6. Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 6. You should about be able to quote this and have this and memorized. This is one of the Ten Commandments. Amen. Here in Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. There in the first three verses, it's reiterating one of the Ten Commandments that you're to honor your father and mother. You should listen to them. You should obey your parents. Avoid a life of fussing, of strife, of stress, of heartache, of hatred, of hard feelings, of a house that's in a mess. You don't have to have the drama. Or oh, I think they say issues today, don't they? Everybody's got issues Amen. It's your choice. I, I, I tell you, one of the hardest times that most parents have is when teenagers get to a certain age. I call it the stirred nest syndrome. Like an eagle, when the eagle's about ready to fly, the mama's ready for it to fly. She stirs the nest to make them uncomfortable. And, and so they'll start trying to get out. And they want to fly, but they're still a little scared to fly. They still need the parents to feed them. They still need the parents to, to guide them. They still need the parents, but that desire to fly is there. And that's the hardest time with a teenager. Because they have an adult body, but their mind's not quite ready. Their confidence isn't quite there. Or their confidence is there and it shouldn't be. Amen. A lot of them, a lot of them got so much, too much confidence. They can do everything when they can't do nothing yet. That eagle thinks, that little eagle thinks it can fly and it jumps up on the edge of the nest and mama knocks him back in. But no, he jumps back up there again and jumps off to his death. Because he jumped too soon. Sometimes they jump too soon. Avoid a life of fussing and fighting and stress and drama. Look at Proverbs. Back, back in Proverbs chapter 30 verse 17. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 17. Proverbs 30 and verse 17. The eye that mocketh at his father. Oh, he don't know nothing. <laughs> 
He's this old man. He thinks he knows it all. He don't know nothing. I've got it figured out. And despise us to obey his mother. I don't have to listen to her. The eye that mocketh at his father and despise us to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pluck it out and the young eagles shall eat it. That was a grave warning. Before you learn to give orders, kids, before you ever become a leader that can be used by man or God, you're going to have to learn to take orders. You're going to have to learn to take orders. Learn to obey mom and dad and do what mom and dad say when mom and dad, say, dad says to do it. And people will notice that. You'll be in the habit of obeying authority. And now I'm going to get to that point in just a little bit. But it will make a huge difference in your life. One of the, one of the, one of the greatest lies of the devil is to tell a teenager that mom and dad don't love them. They don't care. They just want to ruin my fun. They just don't want me to have any fun. They're just being overprotective. No, they love you and they're trying to keep you from hurting yourself or destroying your testimony or ruining your life. They're trying to instruct you and guide you. You just won't listen. Why? Because of that sturdiness syndrome. You've got that desire to get out, and that's overwhelming sometimes. But before you can give orders, you must first learn how to obey. Thirdly, avoid unclean things. Avoid questionable things. Avoid evil things. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, the Bible says to abstain from the very appearance of evil. If it, even, if it even looks wrong, it's wrong. Amen. If it's doubtful, it's dirty. Avoid the appearance of those things. Uh, why, you should be in Proverbs. Turn back to Proverbs 23 and look at verse 7. Proverbs 23 and verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You ever heard you are what you eat? No, no, that's not right. I'd be a big pickle. I love pickles. I eat a lot of pickles, amen. Don't ask me why. When the heart doctor said I shouldn't have sodium, that's all I craved was salty pickles, amen. <laughs> I don't know if it's old nature in me, the rebellion or all the medicine they got me on makes me crave salt, amen. But I crave salt all the time. But I'm, I'm not a pillar of salt. I'll tell you what you are, though. You are what you think. You are what you daydream. You are what you allow yourself to think about. You say, well, what are you, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Uh, if it appears evil, avoid filthy things. Avoid unclean things. Somebody's always wanting to look at pornography. He thinks on pornography. She thinks on pornography. Guess what you got? You got a pervert. You are what you think. Someone that thinks and daydreams and lusts about different things, fornications and stuff. You got a pervert. Somebody that's always uh, daydreaming about going, running away and doing whatever they want to. You got a rebel. You are what you think. Get control of your thoughts. Control your thoughts. Amen. Amen. Avoid unclean things. Homosexuality. The world's going to push it now. Transgender, the world's going to push it now. Fornication, any sexual activity outside the marriage bond is fornication. Avoid it. Why? Because the world's going to push it right now. That's what the world's pushing right now. They want everybody to do that. That's what they, everybody's doing now. And they're pushing it at younger and younger ages. The movies, the cartoons are even become sexual. I mean, everything has become dirty. Avoid those things. Avoid those things. Avoid those things. Number four, obey authorities. I mentioned it earlier about obeying your parents, but obey authorities as well. 
if you won't obey your mom and dad, there's no chance that I'm getting you to obey authorities. If you, if you, can't, if you, can't, if you can't control yourself enough to listen to mom and dad, you're not going to listen to authorities. You're not going to listen to the teachers, or the, the principal. You're not going to listen to the uh, police officers or the pastor. You're not going to listen to the laws of the land. You're going to get out there and do what you want to. You're going to drive as fast as you want to until you wrap around a tree somewhere or until you kill some family or you kill some kid. Oh, not me. Well, if I die, what difference would it make? Hey, dummy, you might not die. You might survive. And be in the hospital the rest of your life with a tube sticking out of your throat breathing for you. You might spend the rest of your life in a wheelchair. You might spend the rest of your life with a limp or a scarred up body or in pain because you wouldn't listen to the laws of the land. Romans 10, or excuse me, Romans 13 verses 1 where it talks about that were to obey them that have rule over you. That's talking about the laws of the land. Amen. That means don't steal. Don't drink because it's illegal. Amen. Many have criminal records that will follow them the rest of their life because when they were your age, they couldn't learn to obey authority because they wanted to rebel. I don't know what it is about kids today. Uh, it was in my day as well, and probably in their day before them. The only thing I can think of is this old fallen nature that we all have. That old man that didn't get saved, amen. I'm talking about this flesh wants the rebel, wants to be around the rebel, wants to hang out with the rebel. That's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Uh, we were drawn to that stuff, and you have to resist that stuff. And the better you resist it, the better off you'll be. Obey authorities. Don't, you don't have to grow up with a criminal record that will follow you the rest of your life that may keep you from getting good jobs, may keep you from getting a position of respect, may keep you from earning the money that you have the potential to earn. Number five, let's keep going for time's sake. Number five, pick your friends wisely. I cannot stress that enough. I know Brother Ryan, uh, I was out a while back, he preached a message on Amnon had a friend kind of thing. I, I've preached on that thought. Many preachers have preached on that thought. Mom and dad have emphasized that point, who you're going to be with. Well, she shouldn't care who I hang out with or what business of his is it who my friends are. Every bit, amen, because they've learned. They've had some bad friends and they can recognize them. You might be hoodoo by somebody, but your mom and dad might see right through them. And I will tell you this. I will tell you this. Sometimes mom and dad, the worst friend they got is the one you like the most. Because he knows what to say and when to say it. He knows how to behave in front of you. But he's the little devil that's going to get him in trouble as soon as he can. So how do you know that preacher? Because I was that devil. I'm not proud of it at all. But I got a friend. We used to sneak around and drink and smoke together. He'd steal cigarettes from his daddy, and I'd sneak beer and liquor from my mom and daddy. And today, the last time my wife seen his mama she was saying, pray for him. He's drinking. And she was worried about him. And I wonder if I was that dog that gave him the first one. Not in church. I've went and seen him several times and tried to witness to him. Won't even talk to me. He was my best friend growing up. Why? Because he, the beer got a hold of him. The alcohol got a hold of him. And I was the one that gave it to him. Maybe he wanted to be like me. 
What kind of friend are you? Choose your friends wisely. Choose your friends wisely. There's kids that befriended somebody that got them in trouble. There's people in jail today because of the friends that they chose. Well, I wouldn't steal. I wouldn't rob a store. I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't sell drugs. I wouldn't do this. But if you hang out with them and they're carrying or they do something and they get in trouble, you are guilty by association. You were in the car with them. When they was doing whatever they did, you was there with them. When the money exchanged hands, you was there. When they sold the drugs or bought the drugs, you was there. When they robbed the store, you was in the car. Did you know, did you know this is the law of the land? If someone, you, you take and they goes in the store and robs somebody in the store and shoots them and comes and gets in your car and you drive off, you're guilty of murder just as much as they are. Because you were complicit in it and helped them. You will go to jail and you will serve the same time they do. Choose your friends wisely. Number six. Well, I've got one more after this. Number six. Don't give in to peer pressure. Don't give in to peer pressure. Real friends won't pressure you into doing something wrong. They won't pressure you into stealing, lying, cheating. They won't pressure you into drinking, smoking, cussing, looking at porn, stealing from your mom and dad, taking money out of this, doing this. They won't pressure you into that. Real friends won't do that. Real friend cares about your good and you, your testimony as well. Real friends. Don't give in to peer pressure. Talk this way, act this way, dress this way, do this and do that. And you got to have this and you got to go there and you got to do all these things. Don't give in to peer pressure because honestly, you don't know it now, most of you teenagers, but you can ask all these adults in here. When you get out of school, those so-called friends, you're not going to see the majority of them ever again in your life. I've lived in the same county that I was born in all my life, and I, did, I don't see anybody that I went to school with. Angie rarely sees anybody that she goes to school with. Once in a blue moon, you might bump into somebody that you went to school with. So why does their opinion mean anything? You're not going to stand and give an account to them. You're going to stand and give an account of the decisions you make to God. I'd be more worried about what he's going to say than what my so-called friends and peers say. Don't give in to peer pressure. You're a child of the king. You should set the standards. They should follow you. You're to be the example. You're to set the example. You're the leader, or are you going to be a follower all your life? Are you just going to follow whatever fad comes along? If it's pink hats, I'm wearing a pink hat. If I got to have this haircut, I got to have this haircut. You understand what I'm saying? Don't give in to the peer pressure. Just do what the Lord would have you to do. Be a leader. Be a man. Be a leader. Be a woman. Amen. Amen. Be a man and learn what it means to be a man. And be a lady and learn what it means to be a lady. And earn and deserve the respect of a man. Earn and, re earn and deserve the respect of a lady. Amen. Amen. You say, preacher, you're being hard. No, I'm trying to help them. I'm trying to help them. And this last point is going to be probably the most needed point of the day. Don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. You, you're never going to achieve anything. You're never going to have anything. You're never going to earn anything. You're never going to deserve anything if you don't get up and get at it. Amen. Amen. You were made to move. In fact, if you quit moving, you, you run down quick and die. 
You are made to move. Uh, uh, you can ask any of the older ones. If you sit down long, you see them get up real slow and crickety, and after they get to moving, they're good to go for a little bit. <laughs> Amen. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? Hey, I got it too. I got a back. I got a bad shoulder. I got a knee. has been giving me a fit for a couple of weeks. I can't even go upstairs hardly without crying. And I'm like, what's going on? And it hits me. I'm just, I'm just, it's my time, I guess. Seems a little early to me, but maybe it's got to start somewhere, I guess. Amen. Don't be lazy. Learn to work. Turn to Proverbs. You're already there. Turn to Proverbs 12. You should be close to there anyway. Proverbs 12. Proverbs 12. Look at verse 24. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule. What? The hand of the diligent. That's somebody to get up and work. That's a go-getter. That's somebody to get after it. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule. But the slothful. There, there's the lazy, the sloth, the barely moving shall be under tribute. Get it? Look at chapter 18. Chapter 18, verse 9. Chapter 18, verse 9. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. You are wasting your life if you're lazy. You're wasting your talents. You're wasting your future. You're wasting everything if you're lazy. Look at chapter 26. Chapter 26 and verse 14. Chapter 26 and verse 14. As a door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. Yeah, just flip-flop laying in the bed, and laying in the bed or laying on the sofa, playing the video games. Watching the TV, slothful. That's pretty funny because you know how these, you know how a lot of the kids act today, like a sloth. They just they talk slow. They won't even say all the words. It's like, uh. Did you do anything today? Uh. You gonna do anything tomorrow? Uh. Uh-huh. Won't even say the whole words. They just drag out everything. Don't be slothful. Don't be lazy. You will never accomplish anything. You'll never get your dreams. You'll never achieve any goals. No one will want you. No one will respect you if you're lazy. You know why? Because I've worked with them and I know what people think about them. Amen. You work with a lazy person and you know what I'm talking about. They just, they, they do as little as they can to get by. They've got a job to do. They could get it done in 10 minutes. But if they take their time, they can make it last an hour because they know something harder is coming. So they move real slow and they pick up one box when they could carry five, but they just get the one box. I used to work with a guy like that. We put our thumb on him, see, if, see how long it took him to get out from behind our thumb, see if he was moving. Don't be slothful. Do you think that guy's ever going to get a promotion? Do you think that guy's ever going to come up for a raise? Do you think that guy's ever going to be respected by the boss, by the company, by the workers that work with him every day? No. No. Would you want that guy to work for you? No, you want somebody that's going to give you an honest day's wage. You go in somewhere to work, you ought to punch in on time. You ought to turn your stinking phone off. You ought to let your friends, your family know when you're at work, you belong to them from 8 to 5, 3 to 4, whatever time it is you work. When you're at work, you're theirs, and you work, and you do a good job and do your best as unto the Lord. And the Lord will reward you for that. You will gain the respect of your co-workers. He knows what he's doing. He puts in the effort. He puts in the energy. You'll gain the respect of your employer. Hey, listen, I've got a better job, a a more needed job. You do so good on that, I want to give you, I want to put you over something else. I want you to run something else. And you'll get respect with God because you'll be being honest. Did you know to punch in the clock at work and then go talk on the phone or go searching Facebook is stealing. 
they are pay, if they pay you by the hour and you don't give them the hour, you stole from them. You say, preacher, that's awful, that's terrible. You shouldn't say that kind of stuff. That's the truth. If you come back from lunch 20 minutes late, but you had a buddy punch you in on time, you just stole 20 minutes. I used to work with a bunch who would do that stuff. I got paid by commission, so I worked hard. And I'd look over there at them, our workers just barely moving, and I'd, I'd just think, what are, they, what are they doing? They'll never make it to they They wanted to be mechanics. They wanted to be line techs. But they wouldn't put no effort in when they were given an opportunity, so they never was given an opportunity to move up. Most of them was moved out and found somebody that would work that would recognize the opportunity being given them. Amen. I don't care if your job's digging ditches. I dig the straightest ditch of the, of the whole company. I dig the, I would dig it the deepest if it, it, I'd do whatever they wanted. Amen. If that's my job, that's what I'd do. I would do it as unto the Lord. Don't be lazy. The decisions you make now will determine whether you're lazy. I'm going to say something here. It's going to might upset some of you, but I'm trying to help you whether you like it or not. If your kid still lives at home and you make up his bed or her bed, it's time to crack the whip. Amen. If they're a teenager and mom, you have to go in there and pick up clothes out of the floor, something's wrong with your parenting. Who's leading who? You tell that girl to get in there and clean up her nasty filth. You tell that boy to go in there and make up his bed. It ain't going to hurt them. In fact, it might put some character in them that will follow them to the job, that will follow them to the marriage, will follow them in life and make them learn to control themselves. Because that's what it's going to come down to, kids. Can you control yourself? Nuggets for kids. Develop a good work ethic. Do it as you're doing unto the Lord. And that's everything you're given. Whether it's schoolwork. Oh, I can pass the test. I don't need to study. I, I can pass the test. Yeah, but if you studied, you might make a hundred. Go for the hundred. Not just to pass. Not just to get by. That's laziness. Skimping by. Apply yourself and see what you might get. Do you want to just get by and get an average job and get an average life? Or do you want to apply yourself when you're young and be able to get a great job and be able to excel in life? Don't be lazy. If you learn that trait now, if that gets imprinted into your character from the time you're about 10, 12, 14 years old and you don't get it out of you, it will follow you into your work ethic and it will follow you into your home life and it'll mess you up. It'll mess you up. Don't be lazy. If you do this and you apply this, to your life, you don't get mad and you apply this to your life, you'll, you'll gain respect and honor of family, friends, co-workers, and favor with God as well. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes.